Ed was going to, I'm Vic Randano, and Ed was going to introduce me, but it really boils down to this. I was born in New Jersey, I live in Sarasota, Florida, and I hope I don't die on the stage today. <laughs> now, one of the things I like to do is take a picture of my audience. So I'll show you the picture of my last presentation about halfway through, once I get uh, to that slide. I thought it was next, but uh, here we are. So they want to know about conflict of interest disclosure. And that's really uh, an inappropriate statement. They want to know, are you being paid anything that would influence your ability to tell the truth? Because I am being paid today to be here, but I would be paid, I would come here even if they didn't pay me. And when I go to national meetings, I get paid. And so you can consider that a conflict of interest if I um, uh, am getting paid for being there. And when I do AVMA liability insurance and I'm sitting in a witness stand and the uh, defendants uh, or the, um, the plaintiff's attorney asks me, are you getting being paid for being here? I say, of course I'm getting being paid here and I'm being paid well and I hope the same thing is happening to you. And we go on to the questioning. So at the end of the day, what you really want to know is am I being paid anything that would taint the integrity of my presentation? And the answer is no. I know of no other organization in our profession that has the integrity greater than the OFA. They, are, they don't look at the bottom line to see if it's red or black. They look at what's good for animals. And I think that's why we as a profession should, should support them. Uh, they have a dynamic website. If you were here earlier, uh, you would uh, appreciate that. We, ha uh, <clears throat> we had an excellent presentation on the intricacies of the website. And what I find when I have a dynamic website, what I need to be able to do is get familiar enough with it so that I can use it as a resource for those clients who need it. And that tends to be what we do with most of our electronics. We get very proficient at those things that we need to use, and then we research the individual situations beyond that. And this website is a tremendous resource. And you can print out things and give them to your clients, and it's really great. And, and I'm, I can tell you from my experience, I'm bored in both radiology and radiation oncology. Our client base is expecting more from us in terms of knowledge. And at the end of the day, well, we're just doing so much and we're getting so exhausted. But <clears throat> I do both radiology and radiation oncology, and I know what people tell me when they come in with a dog with a bladder cancer. They say, how come my veterinarian didn't tell me about this, and how come they didn't screen for it? And I know from experience that Beagles and uh, Shelties and West Highland Whites and Scotties, females over the age of eight who are overweight have an 18 times higher incidence of bladder cancer than all other breeds, so why aren't we screening for them? And for these genetic testings, when people are going out to buy pups, you may not need to go over every genetic test, but you gotta let them know where they can go get it, and that's what this website has been developed for. And one of the reasons why physician medicine has skyrocketed in certain disease processes is they have a huge database and they can track things down. And the OFA is working diligently to get that online, and it behooves us as a profession to support that and give them the data they need. And if you go there, you can read a, uh, this literature on uh, positioning and incidents and what have you. So uh, that's where that's coming from. And, and when did I get interested in this? Well, if you, you look at this paper, you can see this is a paper that I generated in the 80s. And I've been working with them since then, and they've been constantly trying to improve. And this is a, a fairly uh, thorough thesis on positioning for hip dysplasia. And if you want a copy of this paper, you can contact the OFA and they'll send it to you or they'll contact me and I'll send it to you. And today we're not trying to determine which is the best test for a particular condition. What we're trying to do is evaluate the OFA's method of screening. And since I've been doing this, there's been a lot of tests that have been developed. There's MRI imaging, which is in the center. Oh. <clears throat> this is MRI imaging. Um, this is conventional radiography. This is CT imaging with 3D uh, reconstruction. We used to just start with palpation, and then we've moved on to radiology. Uh, this here is ultrasound. So there's a lot of different tests out here, but what we're specifically approaching today 
is the test to look at the hips using the OFA screening protocol. The question I have, the uh, the question I have for the audience, uh, and I expect somebody to answer, <laughs> how do you know this is an MR rather than a CT? How do you know that that's an MR image and not a CT image? Excuse me? Uh, excuse me? The contrast? Well, that's one thing. But the, uh, uh, you can vary the contrast, so that's a good answer. But the surest way is to look at the bone. CT uses x-ray. And when you use x-ray, what color is bone? White. MRI uses, electro, uses magnetic fields and radio frequency, and with MR, bone is black. So if you look here, you see how the bone is black there? That's how you know you're dealing with an MR. So if you approach a screen or a specialist shows you an image, look to see if the bone is white or black. If it's white, it's CT. If it's black, it's MR. So here's the picture of the audience uh, 15 minutes into my last presentation. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's the end of the day. How do you not love a baby and a puppy? It's just like so great. Uh, this here was a situation with a divorce attorney. Uh, <laughs> I got involved because they had a dog and uh, each, per, each of the parties wanted the dog, but uh, that was her car. She did okay in that, I think. Now, you know, what's my credibility? I'm, I'm like you, you get up and 80% of us do exactly the same thing every day. It's the other 20% that makes us a little bit different. So I started out at Cornell University and then I developed a primary care veterinary hospital. It was 10,000 square feet. We boarded 100 dogs. We had four veterinarians. And then I started a specialty center. We had 145 employees. It was huge. I uh, sold that when I was 65 and now I have online imaging. So I've had everything from uh, academia to private practice, especially practice, to being a consultant online. And the major difference between this and this is when I was here in academia, my biggest concern is when the coffee was going to be ready. When I was in private practice, my biggest concern was, like, was I going to have enough money to buy coffee beans on Monday. So it really is a different paradigm of what we're trying to uh, accomplish. Now, those were, who were here earlier in the day may have heard the name of John Olin. And uh, John Olin uh, uh, was a business magnet. I had the opportunity to meet him. And he was interested in hip dysplasia because he had hunting dogs who were not doing well. And so he elected to start funding a project at uh, Cornell University and then at other places, including the OFA. So we are indebted to John for the, the money that uh, we put in that he put into veterinary medicine. From looking at him, do you think he had a placid personality or a strong personality? Yeah, pretty strong. Um, but he, he was very good to veterinary medicine. <laughs> What's interesting is the uh, cycle of life and the faith of things that happen. Yesterday, as you know, was uh, Martin Luther King's day, celebrating uh, his legacy. And when at Cornell, in the late 60s, uh, there was an uprising and uh, the armed students took over Cornell University. And so what happened is John got so upset, he pulled most of his funding for the projects that he was doing in academia. But what project do you think he kept funding for the rest of his life? Veterinary medicine and animal welfare, because it goes back to the bond that these people have for their animals. Now, people say, well, I don't have good equipment. Sometimes you don't have the best equipment, but the equipment you have, if you use it to your best of your ability, will help you make a diagnosis or at least give you an appreciation of where you should go. Uh, this here is, uh, I was driving home on a major highway. My phone rings and it's a veterinarian and says, Vic, I got a dog here, it's really sick. I think it may have pneumonia. So I said, well, email me a picture of it and I'll look at it and give you a call. So he said, well, I, I, I don't use email. I said, well, do you have a cell phone? He said, yeah. I said, take a picture and send it to me. So this is the picture he sent to me. Uh, and I said, great. He's got uh, consolidation unilaterally. It's a young animal. They just got him out of a pound. Let's treat him for pneumonia. And if he's not better, then we'll have to do more diagnostics. And he treated him for pneumonia. And a couple of days later, um, he let me know the dog was doing well. And so that was the correct diagnosis based on a response to the biologic behavior. 
<laughs> now, what's interesting is this was about a 0.5 megapixel uh, camera. And then last year, he decided he was, still wasn't going to go digital. He still had his analog equipment. He called me up. He said, Vic, I got a lame dog. I think I'm going to have OCD in the shoulder. So I said, well, email me uh, from your digital equipment. He said, no, I still I got upgraded my uh, cassettes, but I don't, don't have digital yet. And I said, well, take a picture of it and send it to me. And this is what is an uh, eight uh, megapixel uh, digital camera. So he's moving in the right direction. <laughs> Uh, you never know what you're going to see when you're ready to graph an animal. This was a junkyard dog that was losing weight. Look at that. How could that dog eat that? It's just like unbelievable. So we see some really interesting things that come in through the door. Um, I do have another life. I'm Italian, so I have to be in construction. And that's my uh, backhoe loader. And my wife on the left of 48 years. And... Uh, our, our grandson, and that my daughter is holding that post up. You can see her in the lower left-hand corner here. She actually is a, a, an MD in emergency medicine and critical care and an MBA, but she helps dad do construction on the weekend. Anybody know what a uh, PET scan is? Okay, what uh, we know that uh, cells need sugar in order to uh, survive and grow. And so somebody came up with a great idea. Let's put a radioactive substance on sugar and inject it into the vessel and then scan for radioactivity. And that's what a PET scan is. And so here's a person who has got a big lesion in the chest superimposed over the heart. And you really can't see it in the conventional uh, CT image. But you can see that big white plume. That's where the tumor is. And it's eating sugar. And that sugar is radioactive. And that's now how we can detect where that lesion is. And that's very commonly done when we're looking for uh, distribution of uh, cancer or biological behavior. And so that's what a PET scan is. Uh, if you want to know uh, where's my office, uh, so you can see my office there. My kids gave me the padded seat, and uh, we got a, a computer. We can do all our things. Now, some people are better at uh, perceiving um, <coughs> differences than others. So when we look at this, Look at that and see, uh, can you find the two lines that are identical? Yeah, good. And uh, those people who can, who can uh, see that there are two that are identical and the rest are different, were those who think they're all the same. The first category will be radiologists. The second category will be the surgeons. <laughs> Am I doing OK? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Vic, are these hip joints normal? <laughs> so, you know, okay, that beautiful imaging. So I said, response, what happened? Oh, he just jumped out of a car and the owner wanted to know the status of the hips before I did surgery. Because if the hips were bad, he was going to have them remove the uh, femoral head and neck. But if the hips were good, he was going to have them try and save it. Uh, does that sound all good? Now, if you don't take anything else home from my presentation, the two things uh, I want you to take home is always look at the entire radiograph, OK? And always make sure that the information that's being provided is validating what the radiographs are telling you. And the reason why I say that is I made a living at Cornell when the cardiologist was looking at the heart, I was looking at the spine. And they say, oh, it looks like he's got heart disease. And I said, yeah, but what are you going to do about the cancer in the spine? Or when the surgeon was looking at the broken pelvis and telling the students how he's going to fix it, I'd say, yeah, but what are you going to do about the diaphragmatic hernia? Because the dog will probably die under anesthesia if you don't do something about that. So I'll always look at the same thing. So notice that he says, oh, he jumps out of the car. Well, when I look, what do I see there? I see a vulva, and I don't see an os penis. So in fact, this was a female dog. So I emailed them, and I said, uh, 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 you sure this is a, a male? He said, oh, no, we mislabeled it was a female. And I, I once saved a veterinarian's bacon who was uh, accused of making a misdiagnosis because of the contour of the os penis. The one dog had an os penis with a separate center of ossification. The other did not, and the plaintiff uh, um, contended that the veterinarian had made a misdiagnosis and called their dog normal when it was, in fact, abnormal. 
So when I got on the witness stand, they said, what do you think? I said, they're both, the, vet, the veterinarian and the owner are right. They're both different dogs. And they said, well, how do you notice that? And I said, well, look at the Ospenus. You can see that one has an accessory center of mineralization. This one does not. So the veterinarian was exonerated. So always look at the entire image. <clears throat> also be aware of other things that can impact on the question that's being asked. When we looked at animals that had hip dysplasia and, and we did survey imaging of all their joints, if they had hip dysplasia, 15% of those dogs had arthrosis in another joint. Uh, so sometimes they're lame, not because of the primary site of concern, but because of a secondary uh, problem. And this one here, I didn't see anything that was abnormal relative to those uh, hip joints and the sur surgery that was done. There's no evidence of implant loosening or migration. But when I looked at the stifle, that animal was lame because he had disease in the stifle joint. And when you look at this lateral radiograph, you can see new bone production there and new bone production there. And the telltale lesion is right there. That's where the cruciate ligament inserts. And that indicates that this animal unequivocally has cranial cruciate ligament degeneration. And then you can see you can see the joint fusion bulging the capsule cranially and pressing in the patellar fat pad. And the veterinarian said, well, the do dog didn't have any joint laxity. 40% of dogs with cruciate ligament disease don't have joint laxity. They have a tear involving a, a partial tear of the cruciate ligament, just like a core lesion in the tendon of a horse. But if you see that reaction there, that cruciate ligament is abnormal. In addition to positioning, you got to be aware of exposure. And if you look here, this is the same elbow using different exposure techniques. And the reason why I put that up there is you can see that thing right there. And that's a sesamoid bone. And that's an anatomical variation. But if your exposure isn't good or your positioning isn't good, even something that's fairly substantial in size is going to be missed. So not only do you have to have good positioning, but you have to have good exposure. And if the exposures are not coming out like the way you want them, then you ha either have to interact with the person who sold you the equipment or interact with a veterinary radiologist who you can send images to and get some suggestions on how to improve your, the exposure. And that, that's a, a sesamoid bone in the supernator. Now, they talk about scientific-based knowledge. You know, it's got to be scientifically based. What does that mean? We're all out there doing the best we can. And in 19... 1976, I, I had never seen that before. And I convinced a physician orthopedic surgeon that it was an avulsion fracture. He went in and removed it. The good news is the dog got better, so he thought I knew what the hell I was talking about. And so what we do is we modify what we're thinking and saying based on what our experiences are. And if your specialist tells you something uh, that you're not comfortable with, you gotta question it and say, well, explain to me why you believe that's true. Because in my experience, about 10% of what I tell you today is not true. My problem is I don't know which 10% it is. And I rely on you helping me out. And I, was, I have five centers where I, te teach hyper, I treat hyperthyroid cats. And I had a veterinarian in an audience say, do hyperthyroid cats get cystitis? I said, geez, I haven't experienced that. So I told my staff, start marking in the histories, circling any time they mention cystitis. And don't you know, hyperthyroid cats start getting cystitis about six months before they're clinically affected with the hyperthyroidism. So there, there are links that you bring to the table when you're interacting with the specialist. Now you can see the marked difference in technology here. These were taken by the uh, same veterinarian. The one on the left was using analog imaging, and then the one on the right was taken about four years later or three years later after he got a digital equipment. So digital equipment has given us the ability to get much better radiographs um, uh, because we can modulate what we're doing. The instructions are not always clear. You can read them, but they don't always tell you exactly what you should be doing, you see? So sometimes you misinterpret what they're telling you to do. And sometimes when you look at an image, you're not, you're not quite sure what's going on. You know there's something there, but you're not sure. And it really does behoove you, if you're looking at an image and you're not sure what's going on, is to go away from it and then come back later on. Because sometimes you'll go back and look at it, and it's just so obvious that there's a corn cob in the intestines or there's a, a, a hairline fracture somewhere. So having a second look 
is, is a vital importance of imaging. And also, we need to be able to look at things uh, at enough angles in order to be able to make a meaningful statement. If I said, how many horns does this goat have, you really only need this one lateral view to know that it has a horn, at least one horn. It's just like a fem uh, femur that's commonly fractured. You only need one view, really, to know that it's fractured. But where are the fracture fragments? How many people think this thing has two horns? How many people think it has one horn? How many think it has no horns? How many are praying I don't call on them? <laughs> okay? So, basically what we were seeing was a shadow. And then you also have to be familiar, and that's why it's good you go to education. I tell veterinarians, when you stop reading and going to meetings, you got 18 months of viability and then it's time to quit. Because you keep looking for refinement of thought. What am I looking at here? How many people think it's coins? How many people think it's uh, solid washers? Okay. How many, what do, you, what do you think? What do you think? What? Okay. How about if I showed you that other view? The eggs. And so now, next time you see that, you'll put eggs in your list of differentials. And so, okay. I'm getting to the positioning, but I got to warm you up, you know? It's just a, <laughs> they sent me this one to know if the animal had hip dysplasia. I said, does it have hips? <laughs> but that's an obvious one. But I have to impress on you what, how motion really impacts on what you can see. Just think of that toy breed dog that's coughing and panting quickly, and you're just going to take a quote unquote quick shot to see what's going on. And, that, and there's motion all over the place. And you're going to look for a subtle lesion in this dog that's bouncing around all over the place. You got to control the situation, or the situation will control you. What did I radiograph here? Well, I took my wife's pearl earring and I put it in a pearl bottle, and as the earring was flowing down towards the bottom, I took a radiograph. Now, if I had put that on the side so there was no motion, I think everybody in here would be able to tell that there was a pearl earring. So if you try to radiograph these hips and the elbows where you're not controlling the situation and there's motion, you're going to miss pearls of information, especially if it's subtle. Because everybody could tell that there was something in there, but few people could tell exactly what it was. But once you got rid of that motion, once you control the situation, then you're in control of what's going to happen. How about obliquity? Geez, why does my x-ray tube have to be lined up to where I'm radiographing this thing? Well, what did I radiograph there? Tennis balls, correct. Now, I left those tennis balls on the table, but I moved the x-ray tube about a foot and a half to the right, and I re-radiographed them. What do you think? You see that? All of a sudden, you go from a dog that has a normal cervical vertebrae with no IV disc degeneration to, boy, the disc, look how screwed up the disc are. The vertebrae are all overlapped. Totally wrong diagnosis. What you, you didn't do the best that you could with the technology you had. You didn't control the situation. You didn't stop the motion. You didn't put cotton between the neck and the table so the neck wasn't bowed. You didn't collimate down on the area of interest. And so you took a radiograph and it led you down the wrong path. And the same thing will happen with the hips and the elbows if you don't do it right. Now, before I start getting into the actual positioning, this is absolutely essential and it's radiation exposure. And there are a lot of different uh, formulas for discussing uh, radiation exposure, but the Rendano formula works. And the two things you gotta remember is an eyeball and marbles, okay? Eyeball and marbles. And your body is the eyeball and the x-rays are the marbles. Now, if I have one marble and you're a mile away and have a small eye, and I'm gonna throw this marble to try and blind you, what's the probability I'm gonna do it? Almost negligible. Can you say I can't do it? No, but what's the probability? But if you're a cyclops, you're a foot away, and you give me a bucket full of marbles, what's the probability I can blind you? Pretty high. So remember, Make your eyeball small. Don't be in a room if you don't have to be. If you're in the room, uh, stay at arm's length. Uh, wear protective garb. And one of the biggest mistakes I see 
the females making when they're holding an animal is that they're leaning over holding the animal. And one of the three most sensitive tissues in your body relative to radiation exposure is breast and thyroid. So why the hell would you lean over and expose your thyroid and breast when you're wearing your protective gown? Stay upright, bend your knees. It's the, it's the using the common sense that you have. And one of the big problems we're having in veterinary imaging now and radiation exposure is that when we were using analog, if you took a radiograph that was underexposed, it was white, and if you took a radiograph that was overexposed, it was black. That doesn't happen with digital imaging. Why is that? Well, here's the analog of a specimen that we worked on. It was a hum humanoid specimen, and as we increased or decreased, as we increased our radiograph exposure analog, it got dark, and as we decreased it, it got light. Here, we changed the exposure settings the same amount as above, but with digital imaging, the algorithm compensates for it. So what you need to do is get a specimen and radiograph it at different settings and use the lowest setting that will still give you an image that's of diagnostic quality. You don't need that much radiation if you can get the same image with that amount. Just show you some of the things from veterinary medicine. Here's a uh, tech holding an animal and the veterinarian's holding the uh, machine. Not so good. These are cases that are coming into me on a regular basis. Here you can see eyeglasses where they're leaning over while they take the exposure. Here they're holding them for a hip dysplasia evaluation. You don't want to be in there if you're pregnant. Uh, um, if you're carrying genes that predispose you to breast cancer, you don't want to be in there. Oh, these are some of the things that have been sent to me to test. This here weighed about 45 pounds uh, because I used the eye analogy, so they came up with this thing where you could cover one eye or the other. I thought that was good. It was about 40 pounds, so you got neck pain. But I thought the most innovative one, that was that there. And after she sent it to me, she said, what do you think? I said, well, it may work, but we only have about 10% male students now. But if you're going to manufacture it, I recommend you put the staples in the other way. Okay, so let's get on to uh, hip dysplasia and evaluation and how I position them. Um, <clears throat> when we look at the top here, we don't really have a problem between this one here, which is normal, and this one here, which is grossly abnormal. You could use almost any technique and almost any positioning and see that that one on the right is in bad shape. What, where we have the problem is when we're dealing with these three lower categories. And this is where a lot of the questions come in. What, what does a pregnancy do? What does, if the animal has a systemic infection or a fever, if the animal's been exercised a lot the day before and has a joint diffusion, what does that have to do with the appearance of the hips when we radiograph them? And so these are the ones that we struggle with to try and get the best imaging that we can to at least make the most enlightened decisions that we can. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> okay. At the end of the day, there's the right way, there's the wrong way, and there's the Rendano way. All I can tell you is from doing this for 46 years, the Rendano way always works. Always works. If it works for you, great. You'll be happy. If it doesn't work for you, at least you tried it but I recommend that the animal be heavily sedated or anesthetized. I recommend that you use some type of trough to support the animal. I recommend that you not have the animal's paws on the table. They should be at least three to four inches off the table, and they should be taped to the end of the table. And I recommend that you use gauze or tape around the thighs to keep them parallel. Why do I recommend that? This allows you to get as close to the truth as you can in positioning, and when you take the radiograph, if it's not 100%, you can easily go back in and make the final adjustment. So this is the Rendano way. I, put, I support the torso with this. I lift the legs off the table with a foam block. I tie them in place with uh, gauze or cotton, um, uh, gauze or tape, and I tape their paws to the end of the table. It always works. It takes a couple minutes more to set them up, but once they're there, you're not frogging around with it. You can move it along very quickly. Uh, are there things that can affect 
how the hips look. Yes, there's controversies to whether you should radiograph them if they've just had a litter or they're close to having a litter. Uh, since there is controversy, why do it? Although some people will bring them in is getting ready to whelp or just whelped, and I need to know if they have good hips. But if you can be outside that question of the influence of pregnancy, then uh, radiograph them uh, when they're outside that, that window. I find that when we try and hand hold uh, or lightly sedate them, we don't get as good a quality. So I usually use a general anesthesia protocol. We've tried all types of things. You can see this is a mess from the get-go. The owner insisted that their German Shepherd could not take uh, anesthesia. And she said, well, let me show you how I can hold it. Well, what do you think happened there? It's a total mess, you know? Um, and so I said, oh, okay, you can do it. Uh, but uh, I no longer get excited. If they want to do it, I say, great. This is what I charge an hour. Tell me what you want me to do. And if it works, great. If, if it's ethical, great. If it's professionally correct, great. If not, we'll go from there. So we finally wound up anesthetizing the animal and got the radiograph. Uh, there's a lot of people who hand hold. The problem with hand holding is if you get it right, great. But if you don't get it right, now you've got to go back in there and reposition the animal. They're, they're, you're, and you're always starting from ground zero to get that positioning. Whereas if you, if you tape them in um, and you take your radiograph and you haven't moved them, you can make finer modifications. And there's all types of uh, positioning devices out there. I prefer to use this one here. I find that's better than the sandbags or the wedges. This is the one I like to use. I also find it's better than, than the hard plastic. I prefer not to tape their legs down like that. It gets harder to position them. It also puts stress on the hip joints. Everybody in here, you got to make it comfortable for the animal. If I asked you to sit, sit on this table, how long would you lie on that table? How long do you think you could lie on that table before your back hurt? But if I put a pad under you and I put a, a bolster underneath uh, your stifle joints, next thing you know, you'd be sleeping because I made it comfortable for you. And if we do that for the animal, you'll get better imaging. Uh, if you have an animal with a really prominent dorsal process and they're not anesthetized and you put them on the table, don't you think that hurts? So why wouldn't you put a pad underneath them? Why wouldn't you give them a little sedation and control the situation and position them right? Uh, why would you leave the lights on? If you're on a table getting a, a study done, an ultrasound study, and you're looking at that light up there, you think that's great? It makes them uncomfortable. I, put, I have Christmas lights on a rheostat in my, exam, in my uh, radiology room, in my ultrasound room. They almost, after, they'll struggle for a minute, but then they fall asleep. It's a comfortable environment. So make them comfortable just like you would like to be comfortable if you're having an exam done. Now, why don't I like to uh, put them down on the table like that? Because when we looked at the stress at different angles on the hip joints, we found that when we pushed the hocks right down to the table, it actually pulled the, the femoral heads into the joints. It was like having a, t a towel in, each, in one towel in your hands. And as you turn them, what happens to your hands? They get closer together, but it puts a lot of stress on your hip joints. And you notice that yourself when you lie on a table without anything underneath, underneath your uh, knees. It starts hurting after a while, and it hurts on your hips because you're putting a, a lot of stress on the ligaments in the capsule. So by raising them up, like you see here, you get rid of that problem. Now, um, a lot of these animals we're radiographing <coughs> are going to be used for breeding. So why wouldn't you want to protect their gonads? Okay? So what you do is you get a, a piece of lead and you put it across their uh, caudal abdomen by the ilii, or you, you get a piece of lead and you, you put it over their testicle, between the tube and the testicle, and you now have a gonadal shield. Okay? And that works really well. And you have it so that it's not over the hip joints. So it doesn't take much to do a better job when you're aware of what is a better job. And I'm telling you, the people see this and say, what is that? And you say, I use the gonadal shield. All of a sudden, it bumps you up in their eye because they know that you're looking out for their animal. And, and I will tell you, when I go to the doctor, I'm very proactive. And if I think I need an MR, 
and the doctor says, I don't think you need an MR, I say to the doctor, would you put in the history that I requested an MR and you said it wasn't necessary? You know what happens the next day? I get an MR. And so I go to the dentist and I said, I want a thyroid shield before you do this circumferential CT. He said, oh, it's so collimated, you don't need it. I said, put in the record that I want, <laughs> want a, a thyroid shield. He sent his tech out to go buy one because he wouldn't do the study until he put it there. So you gotta be proactive. Now, you, you can't, uh, I gave this lecture and then somebody sent me these radiographs and said, Dr. Rentano, I used the, uh, the gonadal shield uh, device and look at how great it worked. He had his hand in the glove and he t grabbed the testicle from left to, to right. I don't know. You tell me. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> I said, well done. Rotate your hand 90 degrees. Okay. So what does it look like when I get it? This is what it looks like when the OFA sends it to me. On, on this side here, you can see the list of no numbers of animals. We generally get 25 to 50 in a batch. Here you can see the radiograph of a particular animal. It gives us information about the uh, age and breed. And then it asks us to uh, categorize the status of the hips. Do we think they're normal or abnormal or borderline? or are they non-diagnostic, and if they're normal, are they fair, good, or excellent? If they're abnormal, are they moderate, mild, moderate, or severe? And then over here, we have another list of discriminators. Does it have subluxation, or arthritis? So that's that. Uh, we need to be aware of the, uh, the breed and the confirmation of breed. Uh, one of those two guys is a great sumo wrestler, and the other is a great long-distance wrestler. Can you tell the difference? Right? And one's a weightlifter and one's a uh, beach uh, volleyball player from Sarasota. Can you tell the difference? So the same, we, we run into the same thing in our ammo population. So the more you do, the better an idea of the different breeds, the better idea you get of what's normal or abnormal for that breed. And that's what I like about the OFA. They, they allow you to see what the different breeds are and what the incidence of the different uh, uh, conditions are in those breeds. It brings a lot to the table. And I had people with a, a dog, with a bulldog with really bad hips, and they said, well, I want to be assured that the next bulldog or the next dog I buy has excellent hips. What should I do? I say, buy a greyhound. <laughs> <laughs> now, when we radiograph them, we see some... Let's, I got 12 minutes left. Great. When we radiograph them, we see some uh, interesting things. We see mineralization by the greater trochanter usually an incidental finding. It can be associated with a previous tendinopathy. You can press your thumb on there and see if it's making them sore or not, and you can use MRI imaging to tell if there's inflammation. You can also see a tendinopathy where the iliopsoas muscle inserts into the lesser trochanter. Periodically, an animal will be painful when they abduct, ABD, their leg, and some of those animals have a tendinopathy. The one interesting thing that we'll periodically see is gas in an anal gland. It's usually an incidental finding. Now, we're coming down the home stretch on the pelvis, and then we're going to look at the elbow. Uh, it's, it's important that the animal's pelvis not be rotated, because when you rotate them, you create artificial uh, subluxation on one side and a deeper appearance on the other. And if you look here, you can see these two obturator foramina are not the same size. And you can tell the way they're rotated by looking at the obturator foramen. The obturator foramen that has the bigger lumen is rotated towards the tube. And the one that's rotated away from the tube has the smaller obturator foramen. So if you look at the diameter, you can see the difference. And that makes this hip look better, the femoral head better seated, and this one looks not as well seated. So you can make an artificial diagnosis of a not such a good hip because of pelvic rotation. So that's important to try and have the pelvis so it's not rotated. The obturator foramina should be the same size. And by having them, by using the Rendano positioning recommendation, it's easier to get that. And obviously, if they're markedly rotated, it's very easy to see. And here you can see how uh, that one is, it's markedly rotated, there's subluxation. The good news for, but for me, but not the dogs, the animal hips are so abnormal that even the rotation's not gonna make them better. Now, do we get blindsided? Yeah, we do. We get, you look at this and you say, well, look at these obturator foramen. They're not pristine. But this animal is congenitally abnormal. What is the congenital abnormality? If you look at the spine, the sp spine 
is pristinely positioned. There's no rotation of the spine at all, but he's got a congenital malformation in the lumbosacral iliac joint, and the pelvis is rotated around 20 degrees from the long axis of the spine. So what I do with these is I take two images. I take one where the spine is perfect, and then I take a second where the pelvis is perfect, and I send both of them in. Let the radiologist sort it out. I've done my job. Okay. <clears throat> I thought that was a novel way to treat a dog that had arthritis. Put a flotation device on him and put him in the pool. Okay. My last 10 minutes, we're going to talk about ED. Now, this is a very serious problem. It can make you limp. It can make you non-competitive. It can alter your appearance. It can occur at any age. This condition can occur in 40% of the population, and it can be bilateral. That's because we're talking about elbow dysplasia. Now, some of you may have been thinking about other things, but I'm talking about elbow dysplasia. And there's three things with elbow dysplasia. Ununited ankyneal process, fragmented uh, coronoid process, and OCD lesions. OCD is an osteochondrosis, and it's believed to be because of a problem with uh, uh, nutrition to cartilage. So we got the ununited ankyneal process, we got an OCD lesion here, we got a fragmented medial coronoid process. What the OFA wants in terms of positioning is a maximally flexed medial to lateral radiograph. This is the position they want. If you have to hand hold them, you can do this with minimal exposure. You will keep your eyes, uh, you will keep your eyes small and the marbles down to a low roar by collimating down to the area of interest, by using something externally to push tissue away and by keeping your hands out of the primary beam. And by doing that, you will be able to get a flex medial to lateral. That's what the OFA is asking from you, because they want to see if there's any footprints in the snow of arthrosis. And what they're looking for is reaction on the proximal surface of the ankyneal process. And if you have the leg flex, uh, you can get that. If it's partially or fully extended, the ankyneal uh, process is superimposed over the medial epicondyle, and it's very difficult to uh, see subtle reaction. So what we're looking for in the early stages are reaction on the proximal surface of the uh, ankyneal process. And, the, and this is what we're looking for. We're looking for evidence of new bone production. And it's a screening program. It's not a full diagnostic program, it's a screening program. So we take a VD radiograph of the pelvis with the animal's position appropriately, and we take a flex medial to lateral. If you unequivocally suspect disease that's functionally significant, then you've got to do a diagnostic program. You've got to take oblique and frog leg views of the pelvis. You've got to take a lateral view of the lumbosacral spine. You've got to take a flexed and extended lateral view of the elbow. You've got to take a cranial caudal view, a medial to lateral oblique and a lateral to medial oblique. But what we're doing is we're screening, and we're screening for a smooth contour versus a contour that has proliferative disease. And if you don't flex that leg so the humerus and radius are almost parallel or are parallel to the humerus, you're going to miss the uh, footprints in the snow. And there are a lot of muscles that attach around the elbow joint that can impact uh, disease. So, if you don't have proper exposure, if you don't have proper positioning, you're going to miss lesions. You have to get that leg flexed. Sometimes uh, they want to know, what do you think of this elbow? Well, obviously the animal had a fracture and they put implants in there, but the elbow was good. The cranial caudal view, if you want this teaching module, you can get it through the OFA. Uh, what we usually do is we have the animal anesthetized, we tape them in position and we take different oblique views. We can take the caudal cranial view with the elbows along the side of the head or along the side of the torso, but this is a diagnostic study. It's not the OFA screening study. And so as I come down to home stretch, um, I'll just show you a couple of things that are kind of interesting diagnostically with the elbow. 
Does anybody here know why spaniels have a high incidence of fractures in the distal uh, humerus somewhere between three and eight years of age? The history is usually they go outside, they've been playing, they come back in, they're lame, and you radiograph them, and there's a fracture in the distal humerus. Has anybody seen spaniels with fractures in the distal humerus? No? Well, the reason why that occurs is that during the growth phase, there's a cartilaginous plate between the medial and lateral uh, components of the uh, <clears throat> epiphysis and the distal humerus of dogs. And in spaniels, they have a congenital problem where it doesn't fuse completely. And so what will happen if they put stress on there, it will break through it. And when we look at them with the CT scan, we can see that it's a chronic uh, non-fusion. You can see the sclerosis on each side of the line. And if they just happen to jump off the porch or jump on something, they can break it. And we use different methods to look for it. But uh, we'll finish this. Dog is vomiting. What is your diagnosis? This was an old analog uh, film. You can see all the artifacts that are there. OK. There's a close-up. Why is my dog vomiting? <laughs> you see that? So here you're, look, here you're looking at the nose there. Now, OK, here's the question for the audience. What, what is pink? Go radiographs white and comes out black. Uh, barium goes in white, sometimes it comes out black. Pepto-bismol, you gotta be careful. Because if, if I have a dog I need to do a barium series and I don't have any barium, I give them Pepto. It works. You, know, you gotta be careful in cats because they don't tolerate as well. But uh, you can get away with that in dogs. I, uh, I laud all those surgeons who helped me over the years. And uh, I'd like all, uh, to thank all those people who keep us safe. Again, I'd like to thank the OFA. I thank you for coming. I'll be here later on. I'll also stay here for a few extra minutes. If anybody has questions on anything with positioning safety, yes? What about the pen hip position? Okay. Um, the pen hip always comes up as a question um, in these types of conferences. And remember that I started by saying the, <clears throat> the OFA is a screening procedure. It allows you to get an appreciation of the status of the hips without, with minimal exposure to humans. It also allows you to tell whether the animal has severe hip dysplasia or not, because if it does, you don't need to do any other screening. But if you want a more discriminating test to de determine if there's laxity, then the OFA is not your test. You have to do the pen hip. And I'm pen hip certified. I've done a lot of hips. I worked with the Gail Smith who developed it. I looked at 100 animals. Uh, even before he published his papers with and without compression. But the answer is it's a more discriminating test in the appropriate environment. In New York, he had a lot of trouble with it because in New York, when I was at Cornell, the radiation safety laws were very strict and you couldn't be in the room holding an animal unless it was absolutely necessary under uh, extreme circumstances. So a tech was told that she had to hold an animal for a pen hip. She complained online to the education department that a veterinarian almost lost his uh, license. Other questions? Thank you very much. Have a great day.